I did so much work on this PC, and although we did end up with a super clean and very powerful budget gaming PC, a lot of what I, most of what I did here, was questionable. If you wanna skip all of this PC modding nonsense, which make no mistake, that's what it is, then here's the timestamp of where the benchmarks begin. You've been warned. I have zero sympathy for you if you continue to watch this section of the video. Despite the chaos though, this is still one of the best ways to build a budget gaming PC right now, and it's super easy to repeat. So let's check all of this out after a quick word from today's sponsor. Corsair and the brand new HS80 Max wireless gaming headset. These new Max versions take an already popular headset headset and give them a boost with an updated 65 hour battery life, huge 50 millimeter drivers with Dolby Atmos surround sound, and just like normal, they're as clean as ever. Corsair kindly sent out both the black and white versions which look amazing and they're also super comfortable to wear as well. I love the adjustable fabric strap so you can get the exact amount of resistance on top of your head. And the HS80 has been my go-to choice for my own three to four hour PC building live streams where comfort is super important. You can check these out for yourself by clicking that first link down in the description. All right, so for our starting point, this is a Dell Inspiron 3880, and shout out to Nemes on our Discord server for finding this deal for me, which set me back $131. This was posted on eBay, and it's packing an Intel 10th Gen i5-10400, 12 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, a 256 gigabyte SSD, and a one terabyte HDD. The spec sheet for just $131 is pretty wild, especially when you consider that the price of just the 10400 is more than the entire cost of the build. So basically, I paid for a still very relevant and powerful i5-10400 and got a free PC with everything else inside. All that was missing was just a GPU. Now for the GPU, when you're converting an old office OEM PC like this into a gaming PC, there's a ton of different routes that you can take and I don't really necessarily recommend the route that I chose. This here is the RTX A2000, which isn't even a gaming GPU as it's more workstation level, but regardless, it's still a very powerful graphics card that can play any game you throw at it. These cost $250 usually, which is why I don't really recommend it, but for today's video, I specifically wanted a high-end GPU that had the exhaust blower style fan setup, but we'll talk about that later. Again, if you dare to watch that part of the video. Some other GPU alternatives that I'd consider and honestly recommend over this A2000 are the GTX 1650 Super like I did in this $250 Illidan build. I like the GTX 1650 non-Super like in this Black Panther PC, and I would definitely consider an RTX 4060 low profile if you have a small form factor build, or even just a normal 4060 if you want to spend that kind of money. Our build today is a mid-tower, so it doesn't even require a low profile graphics card. You could fit a normal size card in here, but the reason why I went with the RTX A2000 is again because of cooling. And now that we know all of the parts, let's talk about everything else that happened in the cooling department. We'll talk about the gaming benchmarks after this section, but basically what I wanted to do with this project is to see if I could build a cooling solution that's better than the solution that the Dell engineers provided us with. Now, if you think about it, there's a huge team of professional engineers at Dell that took this PC to the lab, did a bunch of testing, probably tried a bunch of different cooling combinations, and they determined that this is the ultimate setup for cooling this PC. Surely some random PC building YouTuber whose slogan is aesthetics over everything can't beat their cooling solution, right? Right, I couldn't. The first strategy I had with my infinite wisdom was to mount four of these tiny 40 millimeter fans that I paid like $30 for on the side panel and they'll act as intake fans to bring fresh air inside the build. It actually makes sense because if you look at the CPU cooling config, the fan at the top of the heatsink is actually reversed and it's blowing hot air away from the CPU, whereas a traditional tower cooler blows cold air onto the heatsink. When combined with the plastic air duct here, basically the hot CPU is transferring its heat to the heatsink and then the fan is expediting that hot air away from the CPU and into the duct and out of the case. It's a fancy exhaust system. Now this is the reason why I went with that RTX A2000 because an exhaust GPU basically does the same thing. With these style of GPUs, the single fan is what's intaking air into the GPU to cool it, but then it's getting exhaust at the opposite end of the card out the back side of the case. Traditionally, on two and three fan style of GPUs, you're just blowing a bunch of air on the bottom side of the GPU, but then the air just recycles inside the case. In this setup, both the CPU and GPU are exhausting hot air outside of the case, but the problem, or what I thought the problem was, is that there's no fresh air coming inside. There's no fan up here at the front side of the case, which is where you'll normally see it, but the only holes in the entire case are on the side here, so I thought this was a perfect location for my little fan assembly. Before I did that install, we of course tested the stock config and here are the results. After running Cinebench 2024 for both the CPU and GPU stress tests, our Intel i5-10400 reached a peak 
temperature of 80 degrees while the GPU reached 85. Keep in mind that this is during a 10 minute stress test where these components are maxed out at 100% utilization, you most likely won't see these kind of temperatures with a way less demanding gaming workload. Now, these temperatures are perfectly fine just how they are, and as a gamer, you don't need to worry about it, but again, I was trying to outsmart the Dell engineers. I ended up doing a quick test fit of these fans before I painted the side panel of the case just to make sure everything worked properly, and after plugging in these SATA to PWM adapters since our motherboard didn't have any extra headers, everything looked good to go. The installation was actually super simple because there was a hole in the perfect location for all of these fans, so I could easily just drill into the case using the screw and I didn't even need a drill bit. I then powered the system on for the first time and I had no idea that I essentially just built a mini turbojet engine. Yes. This thing was so loud and generated so much airflow that I was shocked with the results and quickly realized that this would be completely unacceptable for any gamer. There's no way that I could have sold the PC after this project to any gamer because even if you had a headset on, this would be way too loud. But again, I wanted to see how low I could get those temperatures. I also repasted the CPU with some Arctic MX4 thermal paste and that probably wasn't necessary either. The paste that was on here looked like it was in pretty good shape and at the end of the day, this system is probably only two to three years old with a 10th gen Intel CPU you in here, it's still pretty fresh. If you're using an OEM PC with like an Intel 6th, 7th, 8th, or definitely even older CPU, you definitely should repaste it. But again, this wasn't necessary. And the theme of this continues to be, that was a waste of time. Once all of that was done though, it was time to paint and instead of just blasting the whole thing with a can of white spray paint, I really wanted to take advantage of these diagonal lines on the front panel. I really like how this looks. It's honestly pretty clean even without painting it, but I definitely wanted to somehow paint around it. I decided to tape off just the lower section of the front panel where the directions of the diagonals change and then I would spray paint the top half and the entire side panel. From here, this was just my normal routine using the Rust-Oleum 2X Paint Plus Primer. This can always goes on super clean and it took me six coats with about 12 minutes in between. Remember, that first coat should only ever be up to a 50% opacity as you can see here, and the second coat at about 75% opacity, and after that you can start to do the complete coats. And as you can see, this did turn out pretty good. I do wish that I would have taped off this bottom corner of the side panel to keep this diagonal going, but overall, I think we did a pretty good job here. I like how you can still see the deep grooves of the painted top area of the front panel, but after I got everything painted, this is where the real problem started to arise. I immediately went to reinstall my 40 millimeter fans that I properly test fitted to make sure we wouldn't have any problems, and here's where I discovered that I guess the screws they provided me with were kind of like a one-time use thing because the screws were no longer catching on the fans. I think during the original install, the screws threaded out the inside of the fan holes and they were perfectly secure then, but now the screws don't catch at all and I couldn't attach the fans to the side panel. Now, I probably could have went to Home Depot and got slightly larger screws and I could have definitely figured out a way to attach those fans on here, but I don't have that kind of time. So the next thing I had to do was figure out what solution we were gonna go with with something that I already had here in the studio. Thankfully, I also had these 80 millimeter Arctic fans and this just so happens to be the same size of the fan that can mount perfectly in the back of the case when you remove the air duct. However, when you remove the air duct, you're now left with a super funky exhaust CPU fan and that definitely wouldn't have worked well without the air duct. So here's why I decided that the experiment we'll be running is to see if a more traditional method of cooling in an exhaust fan is better than the air duct system from the Dell engineers. For the most traditional method possible, we first put the rear fan in the exhaust setup so it's still moving hot air out of the system, but then I reverse the CPU cooling fan back to intake so it's blowing air onto the heatsink. This setup here is how most gaming PCs are set up, albeit most of them actually have some sort of intake fan solution as well. Regardless, we tested this setup again with the repasted thermal paste as well, and instead of our original 80 degree CPU and 85 degree GPU, this time we got the exact temps on the CPU and one degree hotter on the GPU. Yeah, so basically that didn't make any difference at all because here in these neck of the woods at the ZTT HQ, a one degree difference is essentially the exact same thing because our margin of error is definitely higher than one degree. But I wasn't done yet. Next, I decided that we should flip the orientation of the exhaust fan to this time be intake. This is reversed of most gaming PCs. And honestly, this didn't seem like a terrible idea. Now we are bringing cold air into the system from the back of the case, mind you, which isn't a big deal. And hopefully that new cold air gets blown directly onto our CPU. Honestly, that setup makes sense to me. If you would have told me that this setup would have lowered our temperatures by two or three degrees, I would have believed you. But then we tested it. And these numbers are a reminder that you guys should not be following ZTT for min-maxing CPU cooling advice. 
Yeah, no f Sherlock. Here, our CPU was three degrees hotter than the stock config and our GPU was at 86C, which again is one degree hotter than stock. So what does all this official and super technical data prove to you? That the Dell engineers knew what they were doing and you probably just shouldn't mess with it. Seeing a big air duct like this and a reverse CPU fan rightfully gets gamers like us intrigued, but at the end of the day, these professional engineers already did the homework and they determined that this was the best method of cooling this exact type of system. Now, I know they are keeping profit in mind as well, and you definitely could have got better temperatures while throwing more money at it, but with a budget system like this, I don't really recommend that you spend more money on cooling it, especially with the stock temperatures that I showed you. The stock temperatures on the CPU and GPU were perfectly fine to begin with, so if you do want to do one of these office PC conversion projects, just don't worry about the cooling, install that GPU, and maybe more RAM if you need it, and you're going to be good to go. And again, if your CPU is older, I would recommend reapplying thermal paste, but not if it's a 10th gen like we had here because that one was still pretty fresh. With all that being said, it's now time to get to the benchmarks and see just how well this system runs games in 2023, knowing that it's cooled perfectly fine. Shout out to any of you that actually skipped to this timestamp in the video. I don't really like that you lowered my YouTube retention numbers, but again, it was pretty smart of you to do that. And basically the only thing that actually got done was the paint job. All right, so starting with the brand new Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, we created a new budget build guide specifically for this game, if you haven't seen it already, by the way. But here with 1080p balance settings, we got a respectable 77 FPS. After that, we tested Cyberpunk 2077, and with 1080p in medium settings without any sort of upscaling, we still got past our 60 FPS target mark by just a bit. Assassin's Creed Mirage followed up after that, and with 1080p, we could actually bump up the settings too high, and we got a super nice FPS average of 69. We also have Forza Horizon 5, and with 1080p high settings, using the built-in benchmarking run, we got 91 FPS. And you know that I also ran 3D Mark's Time Spy. There's a new 3D Mark benchmark coming soon, by the way, that's called Steel Nomad, so maybe all of these Time Spy scores are about to become obsolete, but yeah, this ultra-budget gaming PC got a score of 6,153, which is pretty solid for the price. Here's all the other games that we ran, and as you can see, we are getting some very respectable numbers with all of them except for Starfield. That's right on cue with all of our other budget builds because that game is just so demanding to run right now. But yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this complete waste of time trying to improve the cooling situation here, and if you're looking for a more streamlined way to convert one of these old Office OEM PCs into a gaming PC, then feel free to click the video that's on the screen now.